Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Yaniv. I've been working for Amazon in the past four and a half years. Uh, most of them at the container services team doing a bunch of business development roles on container services, ECS, Fargate, solution architecture, um, with things like EKS and AppMesh and other things as well. And one of my hobbies over the last year was um, running ML workloads on container services in general and Kubernetes specifically, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm also accompanied by Jackson from our engineering team. Um, if time allows, we're going to have a, a nice little demo to kind of show some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. And if time does not allow, then we have a Kubeflow workshop coming right after this session, so um, stay tuned for that. So I think I'm going to generalize by saying um, we've seen a lot of machine learning hype going around over the last couple of years, uh, specifically things like the cloud giving developers you know, a lot of infrastructure and scalable way to run a lot of workloads related to machine learning at the tip of their fingers or with an API call, um, as well as the advancement of machine learning frameworks and pipelines such as the ones that I'll be talking about today have made it super easy for every company to start doing machine learning. Um, and we at Amazon want to support that. So our mission, putting simply, is to put machine learning in the hands of every developer. And not just developer, but also data scientists, right, which typically um, do not necessarily know or want to get exposed to the underlying infrastructure concepts like VPC or EBS volumes or, or even EC2 instances. They just want to be able to invoke APIs and run their machine learning models through the typical life cycle of build, uh, prototype, build, train, and, and deploy. So I think you've probably seen that before if you've attended any of the AWS sessions on ML in over the last few years. So this is the, the Amazon stack for machine learning. Top to bottom or bottom to top, uh, you choose. Um, the, the more lower you go, it's more compute. Um, do it yourself. Sophisticated, advanced users that want to have like full control. They have a, a ver diverse variety set of uh, EC2 instances, both CPU-based and GPU-based, like P3s and P P2s and the new G4 that we have, um, as well as a lot of um, options on the frameworks that they can run for their machine learning workloads, like TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, etc. cetera. Um, a little bit higher up the stack from that would be the ML frameworks. Um, currently, we mainly talk about SageMaker, which is our um, fully managed machine learning framework. But that's not the only option customers obviously have, and I'll talk about Kubeflow, which is not maybe a full, but a semi-managed machine learning framework that offers a lot of capabilities and that we see a lot of developers and data practitioners use when they're choosing to run those workloads on Kubernetes. And then higher up the stack from that is, if you're a developer, you have no idea about machine learning, but you still want to incorporate machine learning capabilities into your applications, um, then you can just use a bunch of high-level APIs with services like uh, recognition and transcribe and translate and other services that just give you a bunch of APIs that you can consume, which are leveraging the AWS managed models and, and uh, predefined knowledge that we have brought in to make available for our customers to consume. So that's basically a broad set of different layers of the stack that you can leverage for your applications as you're starting to go through that journey of machine learning. Now, going into Kubernetes, because I'm going to mainly focus about that today, um, so I'm assuming most of you know what Kubernetes is um, coming to KubeCon, but why do people love talking about, or why do they love running their machine learning uh, workloads on Kubernetes? And I think the reasons are pretty kind of obvious to those who already have the experience of what Kubernetes gives you. Uh, it gives you a lot of portability, so if you have machine learning workloads or frameworks that are built on top of them, it's very easy for you to take those workloads and run them wherever you want. Um, you can start on your laptop or a desktop in your office that has some GPUs, uh, and then typically as you're starting to grow and the data sets become bigger, um, you would typically be looking for something that would maybe more ad hoc and can give you a lot of compute power um, in a very easy way to scale. And, and a lot of places, that place would be the cloud. Uh, so we see a lot of customers that kind of evolve from running back and forth between a, their on-premises or, or just their, their desktops into the cloud. 
Um, I'm saying back and forth because in many cases, customers still have data that is local um, and is residing on premises and it's not gonna move anywhere else in the near future, which means that some of those workloads may end up still running on premises, whereas other workloads, which may make sense to run on the cloud. And that also means that we need to have like a consistent way or a single framework that we can use to kind of deploy our machine learning frameworks wherever we are. Um, in addition, there could be cases where your company is a global company and has a global footprint. Uh, so it may be deployed in Africa where AWS does not have a region yet. So in that case, you're still going to wanna be able to deploy that machine learning framework. So from all those reasons, customers love using Kubernetes as an open system, as a system that can scale, and also as a system that is composable. So a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about with Kubeflow is actually built on top of a lower level construct, which is the Kubernetes custom resource definition, or CRDs, um, which is the way that a lot of those um, technologies are being implemented, de facto. So I'm gonna talk about two major use cases that we've seen at Amazon, um, mainly over the last year and a half. Um, when EKS launched in June 2018, pretty shortly after we started seeing some very significant set of workloads that are machine learning related. Um, and you're gonna understand quickly why those were significant, and I'm gonna talk about some of um, those compute requirements that are uh, being run by different industries. Um, so that's number one. Number one are workloads that require a really large scale and are really easy to, to run on the cloud and on AWS. So I think one of those industries that's driving that innovation, um, maybe a little bit faster than others, is the autonomous vehicle space. Um, so if you look at, at folks even like you know, Lyft and Uber and many, many other companies that have popped uh, to get you know, ahead of their competitors in terms of getting that autonomy level that they're looking for, which is level five, they often need to run through a pretty rigid life cycle in order to get to that level. And every level that they're gonna to get to in autonomy is gonna be a magnitude order of compute more consuming than the previous one. So a typical workflow really usually starts at the car itself. Um, so in order to train models, you first need to collect a pretty large amount of data, uh, which is typically collected in the car itself. That data is then needs to be ingested. In some cases, the ingestion takes place very local. Um, so it could be like in some facility or farm that was purposely built by that vendor and close to where the, the track is or where the, the experiments are being made. But at some point, they're going to have to move all that data uh, into the cloud. How they're gonna do that is a separate question which I'm not gonna get into in this presentation. It's, a, it's a, an issue on its own. But they're getting that data onto the cloud and now they need a way to build and train their models on these huge data sets. I'm going to focus on two specific aspects in that life cycle. One is the machine learning training. Uh, in often cases, the kind of models that are being used are deep learning models. Deep learning models in autonomous vehicles or, or in general require a lot of compute and are pretty intensive in terms of the amount of resources that they're requiring. So in order to drive that down, we're gonna to need to focus on what we call distributed training. Distributed training is a way to run your model and write it just like you would if you just be running it on your single GPU, but then have that same code or same algorithm that you're running be able to distribute across how many number of GPUs that you have on your infrastructure, and therefore, ideally, you would wanna linearly scale the efficiency with the number of GPUs that you're uh, bringing in. So some of those challenges in, in doing distributed training are how do you actually write a code that can, or how do you write your code to a single GPU but then very quickly with minimal changes is able to import it into running on multiple GPUs. So there are a few ways to do that and one of the most popular ones that we've seen a lot of our customers do in fact is called Horovod, which is an open source library that was developed by Uber and was open sourced. Horvat basically is a framework which allows you to run TensorFlow distributed training uh, frameworks. So the first thing um, these customers usually do is they're using a component called MPI job. An MPI job is a Kubeflow component. And I'll talk about Kubeflow, but Kubeflow basically is first and foremost a collection of tools. 
So one of the things it provides is a construct called MPI job. MPI job merely gets all those algorithms that you have and spreads them between all your running nodes. Now once you have that in place, you can then leverage Horovod as a way to actually do that by node and by GPU, inter-GPU communication using a lower level communication library called Nickel, which is the NVIDIA um, collective communications library, and therefore get that distributed code efficiently. Now what Horovod provides is a very fast and efficient way to do that and with very minimal changes to your code. So that's why we've seen some of those customers that we talked about um, and others that we cannot talk about uh, running Horovod for that. There's also an option to do that with a construct called tfjob. Uh, tfjob is also a Kubeflow construct, which does pretty much the same thing, and it's relying on the TensorFlow distributed algorithm itself. TensorFlow itself has a built-in distributed training um, uh, API that uh, tfjob basically abstracts. Now, that's also an option for you to have. Typically, what we've seen from customers is that Horovod gives them better performance today um, and at more minimal changes in their code than what TFJob gets. That being said, um, TensorFlow 2.0 was released about a couple of months ago, so um, they're revamped the way that, um, that that distributed code works, which may change that. Um, and we still haven't seen that in practice with any customer that we have, so we don't have any data points on how that changes that um, equation. But that is the current state of things with regards to running your multiple training jobs in, um, in, in multiple GPUs. And multiple GPUs means in node as well as between multiple nodes. So you can bring in a bunch of P3 instances. Each of them would have, let's say, eight GPUs. And then you can bring eight of those, so you'd get like a, a cluster of 64 GPUs that you can actually use through Horovod to um, make that almost linearly scalable uh, efficiency. The second thing customers have told us that they're having a hard time with the data. The data itself is a pretty large data set, often cases, and it resides on S3, which is usually the, the place where you're going to ingest it if you're going to go to the cloud. How do you get that to uh, still work efficiently with your Horovod or any other algorithm? So you typically want to stage your data on one of the local, more file system-based storage solutions that we have. And there's a bunch of options on AWS to do that. So you can use EFS, which is our elastic file system, or you can use FSx Luster, which is a very high performance system that gives you that shared uh, data access with a higher performance. And that's what we see customers use the most with these kind of jobs. So I think FSx Luster is definitely standing out. FSx Luster also has a good property of being able to uh, relay an S3 bucket itself. So you can configure the source for that FSx Luster to be your S3 bucket containing all your data set, and then without even doing the explicit copy, that file system will start reading the data as the nodes are starting to consume it from the FSx file system. So it's kind of a caching mechanism to read that data on demand and not having you go through that copying process every time. Also, um, point, pointing out that as soon as you did copy that data to FSx Luster, you should only do that once. So there's no need to repeat that data copying process, we can, which can even take place for over an hour in some cases. Um, but you can just reuse that data through between your jobs if you have some you know, data science pipeline that reuses multiple jobs on that data set. Um, and obviously, all the nodes and all the GPUs can ingest that data because we're re uh, relying here on a shared file system that all the nodes can actually see. It's also pr uh, worth pointing out that we have built a built-in uh, CSI driver that works. So a CSI driver is one of the Kubernetes, the Kubernetes standard for storage. And so you can use constructs like persistent volume and persistent volume claim to actually provision and access that um, FSx Luster file system that you're building as well. So this is how uh, a typical um, distributed training job would look like. Um, you have a cluster running within a BVC on a private subnet. You have a bunch of uh, P3 instances. P3 is uh, relying on what we call the, the NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPUs. So you have a bunch of those VPUs inside each of your instances. Then you have the MPI job as a 
uh, process that just copies all those algorithms and models into each of the nodes. And then Horovod, which is the small component that you're probably having a hard time <laughs> seeing in the middle, which is the process that actually does all the distributed training. Um, and like I said, it's more efficient than the typical uh, te TensorFlow implementation relying on parameter servers. If you want to know more about or even want to get started on running your distributed training jobs, there is a great blog post written by um, one of our principal essays um, called Distributed TensorFlow Training with Amazon EKS. So you can do that. Ajay is actually here right in front of me, so you can come ask questions if you have. Going to our next point. So this is a typical way on running the training. How do you talk about, or how, how would those um, customers of ours go about doing simulations? Why do they even need simulations? Um, so basically, as you probably know, in order to get data for a training job, you need a lot of data. And you, so when it comes to a car, you actually need to do a lot of driving. That's very costly and very inefficient and time consuming uh, uh, experience. So, you know, autonomous vehicles customers want a way to train their models faster. And the way to do that is run a lot of simulations, which is a way to actually simulate the actual real world conditions that a car would actually see when it's driving on the road, right? So, all the obstacles, all the, um, the vision that it needs to be able to see around it would be encompassed in that simulation code that is being run in front of that model. And so it, using that, and it can be like a hardware in loop or a software in loop, there are many ways to run those simulations, but in any case, those simulations are a very time consuming process that requires a lot of compute, not necessarily GPU. Uh, in often cases, that would be just clusters uh, of a mega scale that I'll show in a second that would be uh, required to run in parallel in order to get you those uh, simulations, simulation jobs uh, concluded. So just to give you a sense of what scale we're talking about when it comes to simulation workloads, um, that's actually an example of one of our former customers, um, not former customer, former cases with one of our customers, which is the, um, the Australia Museum. So the Australia Museum was studying uh, on a research a couple of years ago on koalas and why they're becoming more and more extinct. Um, and in order to do that, they had to bring in like a bunch of simulations to try to imitate things like the habitat bar barriers and the surface temperatures and what are the implications of all of these factors on the um, genetic diversity of those koalas. And so to do that, they had to require, they had to run a pretty large cluster. Um, it processed, if I recall correctly, more than three billion DNA uh, pair sequences and it was running on a pretty large cluster of spot instances on AWS, typically consuming between five to 10,000 CPUs or, or cores at the time in order to conclude that. Something that on spot cost them around 30K. So that was a pretty ambitious project at the time. And now let me show you what the typical autonomous vehicle requirement is gonna be compared to that project. So if you talk about AV safety uh, and autonomous vehicle driving, you can barely see the koala genomics line because it's somewhere hidden on that bottom white line uh, at the bottom of the graph. So it's basically touching the, and, and actually even over exceeding the million cores concurrent um, in order to be able to run such a concurrent job on simulation workload. And that's a, just a typical consumption which keeps going higher. Um, the more or the higher the level of autonomy these customers are reaching to. And the same goes for like the total cores that they would need for a year. We're talking about a mega scale compared to those kind of you know, typical use cases that were previously considered ambitious projects. So we at AWS are actually able to provide you with that compute power. And the way to do that would be able to rely on multiple systems. So there are a variety of ways that our customers can run such a simulation job today. One of them is AWS Batch. Um, and the other one is Amazon EKS or any other um, Kubernetes framework that you're gonna bring in. So the way to do that is basically run your spot instances in order to drive the cost down. So we're relying heavily on spot. 
Typically, you would have to consume capacity from multiple AZs to be able to maximize the capacity that we can acquire in a certain region. We would have like an FSX cluster file system to cache data locally on each of those AZs for efficiency and performance. Uh, that data would ab uh, absolutely be copied from an F3 bucket that contains the core data, just like in the training use case. And basically, when you talk about that, that's something that we can actually keep raising the ceiling on and scale more and more, uh, the more our customers are asking to in order to uh, meet the requirements that they have. And, and autonomous vehicles is just leading the charge, but it's not the only industry that's in that you know, place in time where they're gonna have to spike up in a hockey stick fashion. And we're seeing other, other industries coming onto that strong um, as well. Just to give you a sense on the amount of compute that we can provision in AWS in terms of power, so that's just a list I grabbed from uh, Wikipedia on the top 500, uh, top 10 supercomputers as of June. And if you can see the bottom of it, number 10 is actually consuming something around 18 or 23 uh, petaflops, which is the floating point operations that you would require. Now, a single P3DN node on AWS can process one petaflop, which means that by using a cluster of 20 or 20 something um, P3DN instances, we can actually give you like a top 10 supercomputer capacity on AWS in order for you to meet those um, compute requirements. So basically, just helping our customers that run at like super scale in order to run those machine learning workloads which are really like at, at the top of the edge. So that's the number one use case. The number two use case is way more typical and down to earth. Um, it has much more to do with you guys, the developers, the data scientists that are just maybe starting out or just want to run their efficient ML pipelines in a way that's going to be abstracted, it's going to be easy, and it's going to be manageable. So let's talk about that and let's talk about Kubeflow. Um, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with Kubeflow. How many of you are not familiar with Kubeflow with a show of hands? Not familiar. Okay, wrong assumption. Um, so Kubeflow is a framework, an open source framework built on top of Kubernetes in order to bring you capabilities of running your machine learning workloads end to end, starting from model prototyping and development through build of, uh, building of your artifacts, testing them and validating them and, and conducting the training themselves. And then after all that, also deploying them to endpoints that they can after that uh, serve customers in real time in order to get you that machine learning um, application level capability. So this is just a, a description of a bunch of those Kubeflow components that exists today. Not all of them existed half a year ago, but a lot of them are being developed and a lot of them are being graduated as we speak. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, which ones are more um, going to be more first to graduate. So we have the notebooks, um, and I'm going to talk about the, the Jupyter notebooks and what experience that can offer you. Um, we have a bunch of ways to do training, and we have a bunch of ways and APIs to do inference or serving on Kubeflow. So it gives you a lot of these components, and I'll talk about each of them separately, um, as well as all kinds of um, machinery and tools that uh, customers need when they're running their machine learning workloads, like, for example, hyperparameter tuning. So hyperparameter tuning is a way for you to tune parameters that are external to your job. So if you have things like how many iterations do you want to have or what is the queue size for your job, things like that are all considered hyperparameters. And those hyperparameters are often things that you would want to tune and run your job with a variety of, of those values of that specific parameter to see which one results in the best accuracy for your model. And that's what uh, frameworks like Katib, which is what the hyperparameter tuning framework uh, Kubeflow offers are bringing into the table. A very easy and visualized way for you to specify your hyperparameters, uh, for you to run an experiment based on a bunch of or a range of uh, values by that hyperparameters, hyper and then eventually giving you a visualized graph that gives you like what is the accuracy per each of your choices and therefore allowing you to make that um, tuning and which one yields the best, which parameter values yield the best response. So Jupyter notebooks are things that were existing outside of Kubeflow. It's not something that we, or Kubeflow invented, but Kubeflow brings you a managed 
Jupyter and Jupyter Hub experience in the sense that when you install Kubeflow, it installs a, a Jupyter Hub server and you can access that server in a web fashion so you can have access to Jupyter. And I'm gonna ask again, how many of you are familiar or not familiar with notebooks or Jupyter and what it is? Okay, I'm just gonna go quickly over it. So a notebook is a technology that allows not just in machine learning, but other uh, cases of, of big data analytics um, to basically get a page or a web page that you can use to spill out a, your code, your data, and then visually interact with that code and data. So the notebook gives you an ability to actually run your code dynamically within that notebook and get the responses back interactively on your notebook as well. Uh, now, the next step to that is also sharing. So you can also bring notebooks and share them with other users using Jupyter Hub, and so other users can actually see your code, see your models, see the data sets that you have embedded within your notebooks, et cetera. So it's really simplifying the machine, and in machine learning what it does is it gives you a very simplified way to prototype. Because when you start with machine learning, often cases what you start out with is some, a bunch of experiments. So you're gonna write a bunch of code, you're gonna test it out on small data sets at first, and then only those that actually graduate through that are gonna go to the next phase, which is training on larger data sets and, and validation and so on. And so for that experimentation, um, Jupyter gives you a pretty good way to both conduct that experiment and also share and collaborate with other data scientists on that experiment. And it supports a, a variety of pro programming models. Um, you can bring in live code and equations and there's also visualizations. So if you're running, for example, a big data job, you can actually visualize in a graph the results of that job. So there's a lot of goodness into no notebooks which makes it very popular for a lot of the data practitioners in ML and also in big data and analytics. One thing to note here is that we have uh, introduced the support for EFS as a way for you to share that code and data in AWS. So if you're looking to share that code through EFS, that's now an option for you to point to from your um, code running on Jupyter as a place that you can bring the code and run that on and also share that with others. The other thing that we have done is we have built in the AWS CLI so that you don't have to manually bring it in every time. And also we have introduced a support for ECR, which is Elastic Container Registry. So um, all that process of logging in and getting credentials and, and, and using the CLI in order to fetch Docker images from your um, ECR into the notebook in order to run that model which you may have containerized is now something that you can do much more easily within the notebook itself. KF serving is one of the examples I wanted to mention when it comes to um, how do you deploy a serving endpoint on Kubeflow. And again, because Kubeflow is an open platform and it's extensible, that's not necessarily the only way that you can go about it. And we're looking to actually experiment with other customers that we have with other ways to run serving, and, and we're probably gonna be talking about some, some of the newer ways next year. But for now, uh, Q, KF Serving actually gives you a nice stack that gives you a nice platform and an abstraction that allows developers and data practitioners, where, which, whichever platform they're consuming, it can be a TensorFlow algorithm and model or it can be a, um, an uh, MXNet or something else, they can bring it in and actually plug that as an inference endpoint. And so a lot of the complexity involved in provisioning the instances to run that inference endpoint, scaling that, and running that is, is, are things that KF Serving is abstracting for you. So if you look at the stack that KF Serving is built on, um, it's built on Knative, which is a serverless platform to run uh, workloads on Kubernetes without needing to um, be aware of the underlying compute and the auto-scaling required for the nodes, as well as Istio, which is managing all the communications and the ingress um, and on onto those um, inference endpoints. And obviously that whole thing is running on Kubernetes. Now, one of the things that it does is, even though it's running on Kubernetes and even though it's running containers, for the data scientists, the person or the, the team that has developed the KF native interface 
have taken a lot of trouble to make sure that it's super generic. Um, often cases, what data scientists do is they just serialize their model into a file. So in order to give them a very easy and clean way to just specify what that file is that they want to deploy, uh, they just created this simple um, example that you can see over here, which is a very specific uh, or very simple definition that is generic and can work across different platforms like PyTorch, uh, like TensorFlow, or like um, uh, Scikit-learn as well. So that's just a way to kind of not have the data scientists be even aware of all the platforms and the underlying containers that it needs to run in order to do that. Uh, but to keep it abstracted and pluggable. And obviously, pluggable means that you can bring in other interfaces for other types of machine learning frameworks as well. Next in line, I wanted to talk about Kubeflow pipelines. So Kubeflow pipelines is, I think, one of the major developments this year with, uh, with regards to Kubeflow. Uh, it actually takes the, the collection of tools and APIs that Kubeflow gives you and it gives you a something which is more of an end-to-end -end framework, an end-to-end -end pipeline to run your machine learning um, different steps. So each of those steps can be uh, train and model and build, and you can actually implement them uh, using a custom code that I'll show in a second in order to, and, and also create a dependency graph of what is the output of each of those steps and what is the input for the step after it in order to take those dependencies. So if you look at how a typical Kubeflow pipeline component looks like, uh, it has a metadata component into it, and then the spec for the inputs and outputs of each of the steps is being defined in YAML, and the code that actually runs the step is being brought in the form of a container that is just being read by that um, Kubeflow pipeline component. So they're basically interconnected using a very simple code that you can see here. It's a Python code that is being used to uh, specify your pipeline and what steps each of those pipeline components means. And each of those functions is actually going to be implemented using a container, a Docker container. So it's a very easy and intuitive way to run a complete end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline, as well as also to manage it, right? So there are other aspects aside from running the pipeline, like you want to be able to know which experiments you have run, what was the output and the, the outcome of each of those, and kind of be able to track all of those experiments and know which one of them worked better than others. So Kubeflow pipelines give you like fundamental tools to start doing that. Some of those um, components that I mentioned are going to be graduating um, probably pretty soon. You're going to listen to a bunch of uh, Kubeflow talks this week in Kubeflow, I'm guessing. And so um, they're going to talk about the Kubeflow 1.0, which is coming probably early next year, targeting January. And some of those components that I talked about are going to be graduating from that. Um, so more specifically, KFCuddle, which is the command line tool for the deployment and upgrades, is going to graduate. The TF job, which I mentioned earlier in the context of distributed training, is something that is uh, going to be graduating to 1.0 as well. The Jupyter Notebook controller as well, and a profile control controller and the UI. That's actually a pretty significant story to tell because what we're seeing from the enterprises that we talk to is that a lot of the things that they have to custom build today has to do with maturity, has to do with enterprise readiness and production readiness. So um, what customers are looking for is a way to do multi-user access, segregation of workloads, uh, auth and auth z, and those kind of things that will really make it easier for a typical machine learning or even an ops team to holistically manage such a pipeline based on Kubeflow and offer those as resources to their underlying machine learning teams. Because as these teams become bigger and bigger, uh, in often cases, there will be multiple machine learning teams running. And there needs to be a way to kind of have a centralized control over the cluster resources, the allocation of GPUs, as well as the um, separation of resources and quota management for each of those teams and each of those developers. So those are a lot of the things that the 1.0 and, and thereafter is going to be focusing on. Then there's a bunch of uh, components that are going to be graduating to beta, but not yet 
to 1.0 um, GA, and the intent is to graduate them as well in the early part of uh, 2020, which is CADIP for the hyperparameter tuning. I mentioned that earlier. Fairing, um, I haven't mentioned that. Fairing is a relatively new SDK that kind of makes it easier and more abstracted for developers to move their model between the different stages. So starting from a model which is built and then building that to a uh, model that can be trained, training the model, and then following up on that, deploying the whole thing as an inference endpoint. We've seen that there are ways to do each of those steps, right? We have TF job and we have TF serving, and we know how to develop with a Jupyter notebook, but there's no glue that currently abstracts all the kind of handholding of that piece, which is called your model, from one stage to another. Now you can define pipelines, but um, in order to kind of abstract that to developers, fairing is one of those SDKs that makes it easier for the developer to take his model from um, one step to another. So basically that component is gonna be going beta. And then a bunch of other stuff, um, the cave serving is one, and the metadata SDK as the other. And then we as AWS also continuously evolve um, and, and add more and more of these features that Kubeflow supports on AWS. So we've talked about EFS, we've talked about the CSI driver. Uh, we have a whole page right now on, on Kubeflow project which is dedicated to just how to run things on AWS including authentication and authorization and logging and monitoring and many, many other things. Uh, so that page is available as well. In addition to that, we're also going to focus on the enterprise readiness features of uh, Kubeflow 1.0 from an AWS point of view. So we wanna bring in the ability to use, for example, the multi-user support using things like Amazon Cognito and OIDC. Uh, we wanna be able to support managed contributors, with it, which is a new feature. Those things are all gonna be part of the 1.0 uh, and we're gonna be fully supporting them um, as it launches. As well as, we have a recently uh, launched feature which is called the IAM roles for service accounts. That's a general, general Kubernetes feature. It's not specific for Kubeflow. It just means that each of your pods running under a ser uh, service account can actually get an IAM role attached and then get the underlying permissions that role provides for your application running on that pod. So it's kind of a uh, fine-grained uh, auth way to do uh, auth and auth z from a pod perspective under a service account and that's something that we're looking to integrate with notebooks as well. So that each of your pieces running in a notebook, each of your code pieces corresponding to a pod will be able to ingest its own set of permissions using that service account capability rather than having to manually inject credentials which are generic to a node level or to a notebook level. If you wanna know more about everything I just talked about with regards to Kubeflow, um, basically you have two options. One of them is to attend the Kubeflow workshop that we have coming right after this session uh, on 2.30. That's gonna be in the harbor side room. And if you can't make it for whatever reason, we also have an online workshop, which is actually the one that we're gonna run in that workshop as well. But you can access it offline from your convenience um, at eksworkshop.com slash Kubeflow. That's a newly built component that we're going to keep expanding uh, and provide more and more of these components and labs available for you uh, to run. One last call out. Um, we have a Kubeflow AWS channel. So it's part of the official Kubeflow Slack. If you wanted to join there, we have most of our engineers and product managers and myself and other folks from the community um, collaborating with us and all the customers that we have running those Kubeflow pipelines on that channel. So if you wanted to, you can use this self-signed uh, QR, self QR code to register as well. And let me check on time. I think we're not gonna have time for a demo. So You have five of more the, minutes, Yanni, so you can go. We have what? Five more minutes. You think we have time? Yeah, I think we're gonna okay. cut it early. Okay, any questions? We have five minutes so we can take questions on. Uh, I'm 
what style do you need for the demo? Yeah. Yeah, five to ten minutes, let's do the demo. Yeah, so you can have a look. Okay. You want to connect? Any question from the audience for Janif? If there's no questions, we can do the demo. Okay, sure. Yep, sir. Here you go. Can you, yeah, just give me one second because it's a bit hard to hear you. Yeah, I was just asking, what's uh, Kubeflow support for different kinds of databases out there? Do you just, do you keep it kind of open source or do you do any specific uh, supports for certain types of databases? and certain types of authentication as well for those databases? Interesting question. Uh, the question was, what is the level of support that Qflow has for different databases? I don't think it has any specific support for a database per se. Um, I think databases are things that your machine learning workload can interact with and through notebooks, and you can definitely make that connection, like, just like you do with you know, big data and analytics workloads that are using code and libraries to basically make queries on your databases. That's actually one of the typical use cases that I've seen on Jupyter Notebooks before machine learning is a lot of these analytics codes are running from different databases, reading some set data sets from them, making some transformations or ETL code, and then writing the results back to a database. But there's no, there's no like specific integration other than what the SDKs themselves offer um, like MySQL or, or such. Now, if you're talking about the AWS databases, obviously we have the AWS SDK, so you can actually leverage the AWS SDK or the command line from within a notebook to make connection to each of those databases. Well, uh, I'll just uh, briefly go through two components here. And for more details, uh, we can go to the Kubeflow workshop. So the first one is the uh, firing SDK. And most of the feedbacks we get from the data scientists uh, using Kubeflow to run their machine learning workloads is they don't have uh, too many uh, like uh, knowledge on the Kubernetes. They want to concentrate on the data scientist work. So the, uh, so the problem is uh, in order to do some distributed training or the serving, you have to get some uh, basic knowledge of uh, Kubernetes in order to use these uh, primitives to, for example, submit jobs and uh, create uh, like uh, CRDs. And uh, Farin is a, a project to fill the gap. With Farin, you can streamline all the model development, uh, model training, and uh, model inference uh, 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 in just in your notebooks. And you don't have to worry about the Kubernetes uh, like APIs. So here is a basic example. So we can uh, see, we, we, uh, data, as a data scientist, I like to develop my models uh, in the notebooks. And I just write my code. Here is a very simple example to do a house price uh, prediction using XGBoost. And they read the input data and train the model. And then we do some evaluations and save the model. We define a house serve uh, cl a Python class to host this model. And one, once we have the model ready, and uh, we can do a local train. So the, uh, let me see. Uh, see, that doesn't exist. OK. Hmm. Yeah, I'll go back to the uh, part. So uh, it will train the model um, like uh, locally. And after that, um, how to submit this job to Kubernetes, uh, to run on Kubernetes. And uh, Farin, uh, we integrate the ECR, and uh, we use a cloud builder. And the cloud builder will take your code with the base uh, image, along uh, with your other dependencies, and it will submit a, a job to the remote Kubernetes, uh, to the Kubernetes cluster. And uh, this is the example. So uh, the housing uh, service is the Python class we write, right? And uh, we put our training uh, data set and the Python requirements. And we can do a train job submit. 
and bank end use the AWS bank end, which means all the ECR and S3 permissions we already handle those uh, 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 on the uh, bank run. And as you can see in the logs, we submit a job to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes run your training code um, and get some prediction uh, scores. That means uh, you don't have to get familiar with uh, Kubernetes to train some models on Kubernetes. So that's very useful for data scientists uh, training workloads. And same thing, you can create a, a like serving endpoint here, and uh, you can call some um, uh, call the Kubernetes uh, cluster I, uh, uh, service to get the prediction result, and that streamlines the, uh, the model development training and uh, service just uh, in uh, one notebook. Yep. Uh, do you want to go to the paper? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so that's it. So if you like to run those uh, notebooks and uh, get some hands-on experiences, yeah, we can go to the Kubeflow workshop. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you at the Kubeflow workshop.